morning. All right, well, we are going to be in uh, Ruth, and we will be in the first chapter, verses 19 through 22. Verses 19 through 22. And uh, they say that all good literature has three scenes, I guess. So um, we have the third scene here in uh, chapter one. Maybe a subjective opinion, I guess. But uh, So let's start out in uh, chapter one. And I would like to read the whole thing just for context because we'll be... We'll be looking at some of the things that we've already looked at, um, just to cover to cover them more in depth, as it points to what's happening here in this third scene. So let me read it, and then uh, we'll be done. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab. He and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the name of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem and Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. They lived there about ten years. And both Malon and Kilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if, any, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? She said to them, Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi, when the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley feast or harvest. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning just in need of you. Father, help us to see what you would have for us in your scripture. Father, may what is in your word be applied to our hearts. We pray, Father, that you would direct this time 
that the Spirit that He would lead all things. In your Son's name we pray. Amen. Okay, so every week, I feel like I should hang a, ban a banner up that just says the purpose of this book. That God is faithful to His people to bring about a Redeemer. He has made a plan since the beginning of time to save His people. And He's faithful to complete that. He does it a specific way here. Using ordinary people. In their suffering and in their trials, He still builds His kingdom. And so I feel like every week we, we can hang that up as everything that we uh, go through and talks about points to that overarching theme. But I, I just wonder, how many of you have suffered in your life? <laughs> Probably a lot, right? If you haven't suffered yet, you will. Right? And um, the scripture gives us ways to handle our suffering. All scripture is breathed out by God and it's profitable for us, right? Uh, to be godly, to, to live a faithful life. And uh, this morning, we, I think we, we see um, in the book this morning uh, a way to handle uh, suffering. Whether that is from the result of our own disobedience, whether it's the result of some, someone else's actions um, that have caused you to suffer. There's lots of different uh, reasons for why we suffer. Um, could be that God is allowing us to suffer for some reason. Right? He wants to draw us near to Him. Um, he's even, we've seen in Job that He, he even allows Satan to, uh, to uh, cause Job to suffer, right? Just to prove that if you are His, He's not letting you go. So there's all different kinds of reasons, and sometimes it can be mysterious as to why someone is, is suffering. But I think we see in, in our book here that Naomi is suffering as a result of her disobedience. And um, so the main point here is that God is faithful to imperfect Naomi despite her disobedience which leaves her in suffering and bitterness and not abandoning her and bringing, and bringing her home to Judah. So we'll, we'll see her, her homecoming here. And uh, in verses 19 through 21, we see that God is faithful to imperfect Naomi despite her disobedience, which leaves her in suffering and bitterness and not abandoning her and bringing her home to Judah. If you would look at verse 6 with me quickly, what in what way is God faithful to Naomi here? Chapter 1, verse 6. What news does God bring to her? She heard there was food at home. She heard there was food at home, right? She heard there was bread back at home. So this is really the first way that we see that God is faithful uh, to, to Naomi, even despite her uh, disobedience, right? And leaving uh, the promised land and, and going to, the, to Moab, really the land of death, right? And she experiences tragedy there. But God is faithful to her. And then it appears... Even though tragedy strikes and the loss of her husband, she stubbornly remains in Moab at first, doesn't she? It doesn't appear that she is going to learn the lesson she needs to learn. She doesn't turn back until she hears that the famine was lifted in Bethlehem. She then decides to turn to the homeland because of the bread. Sometimes when people hit one of the lowest of the lows, they still will not learn the lesson. And this is what we have with Naomi here. Tragedy strikes, she still stays in Moab for 10 more years, she loses her husband, and then she loses her two sons later. 
But God is still faithful to her. And her heart, I think, will start, into, will start to soften in time as God begins to work on her. But God doesn't abandon her in her disobedience and in her suffering. God is gracious to send the news that there is food back on the shelves in Bethlehem. So she packs up with her two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth, and she heads back. And then we saw last week a major decision is made on the way go back uh, on the way back, really destiny shaping, eternity altering decisions. Orpah turns back to Moab, and Ruth beautifully professes her faith and loyalty to Yahweh and Naomi. And in verses 16 through 17, um, we see her profession. The decisions are made by the girls during three exchanges in which the sadness and bitterness of Naomi's heart comes out. And this is the first way we see God's goodness and faithfulness to Naomi to deliver the news that there is food and to get her traveling on the way. Well, next... If you look at verse 19, where do they arrive at after their journey back? Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Have you ever wondered maybe how they return safely? Well, God's providence is all over this, isn't it? God is faithful to Naomi to return her back to Bethlehem from Moab. And when they come to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them, because uh, that's what the scripture says. And uh, one thing I want to point out quickly is to notice who is not with Naomi and Ruth. Where it had always been her and her daughters-in-law in the text. Now it says the two of them. Ruth had made an, an eternity impact, impacting decision. Her decision to place her faith in Yahweh is eternity shaping for her and for God's people. And note how the book will really start to shift in focus on her ever since her decision. She is honored as a hero of the faith. But notice who is never mentioned again. Orpah. Not once. Silence. What a picture of those who do not place their faith and trust in Christ. <clears throat> in eternity, they will be remembered no more. But the name of the righteous will be remembered forever with God in the new kingdom. But also one has to wonder, as we just said, at the, the providence of God to get these two ladies back to Bethlehem. This wasn't an easy journey. Probably somewhere from... 60 to 65 miles, most likely on foot. They had no men to accompany them at this time, no uh, protection. This wouldn't have been the safest journey for them. But God gets them there. And when God gets them there, it says the whole town was stirred because of them. So what, what faithfulness right, to Naomi. God is uh, faithful to Naomi despite the condition of her heart. What is, what is the condition of her heart that we have seen so far? Bitter. She's bitter, right? Yeah, she's bitter. Hey, guys. She's bitter. And um, she's really blaming this whole thing on God. And so uh, God is faithful to her even despite this, this heart condition. When they get there and the whole crowd is stirred, the women begin to talk amongst themselves, probably at first. They ask, is this Naomi? A town of this size probably had comers and goers often. Not too many people uh, would cause a whole town to be stirred unless they were known. Elimelech and Naomi must have had a prominent reputation when they left. Is this really Naomi? They ask. Coming back in poverty, 
looking awful and sad, and with a Moabite woman. And that's what she says when they begin to ask her out in the open. They ask at the end of verse 19, is this Naomi? And look at her response. And we get the condition of her heart coming out. Verse 20, she said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? This response and her actions in her journey give us a picture of her heart. Just notice first her overall condition, which just gives it away. They ask, is this Naomi? She is almost unrecognizable. Of course, the years probably changed her physical countenance. But she is almost unrecognizable mainly because of her sorrow and her bitterness and her condition. And notice the first thing she says in response when she returns to the promised land and to her people. Verse 20, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Now, do you guys remember what Naomi's name means? Pleasant. Pleasant or lovely. The first thing Naomi blurts out in response to be called this is, don't call me that. Call me Mara, which means bitter. She feels it's much more suitable to her fate than the name Naomi and what that means. Naomi is very bitter. Her bitterness had flung out of her earlier, and we saw that last week. She tried very hard to convince Orpah and Ruth to go back to Moab. Yes, there may have been the probability of a better life on this side of eternity for them, and she tries to convince them of that. But on the other side, Naomi is basically trying to convince them, go to hell. You could say that her bitterness and foolishness ran Orba off from a chance to know God, maybe. And if it weren't for Ruth's profound faith, she may have succeeded with her too. Naomi is no hero here. At least not right now, she's not. I think we're called to be salt and light. We're called to be a good witness. She's really being a stumbling block here to her daughters-in-law. She's putting a stumbling block in their route to potentially knowing the Lord forever. And then she tells the girls explicitly why they should call her Mara. She says, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. She says, I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? Is this the way a faithful believer talks? Firstly, when Naomi returns to her homeland, her attitude should have been one of thank you, Lord, for sparing my life. being gracious to protect me and bringing me back to the promised land. Father, I'm so sorry I've been disobedient. I should have known my disobedience in leaving the land you've set aside for me, leaving the house of bread and trading it in for the land of death in Moab, that tragedy would have resulted. Father, thank you for, it's hard, but thank you for bringing me into a place of lotus and seeing my need for you and, show, and showing me how I'm utterly empty without you. And I'm sorry, Father, I repent and take, the, and take the rest of my life and do as you please. Repentance is a grace, is it not? Covered that in our statement of faith. But she doesn't even stop 
there. You really see the worldliness flowing from her heart. In verse 21, she says, I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. This is a worldly perspective. Naomi seemed to have much before she left to Moab. She had her husband, her two sons. She had the assurance of potential future heirs in those two sons. She enjoyed a great reputation in Bethlehem. She had hopes of a prosperous life with her family in Moab. All these dreams before her. She had a lot to look forward to. She considered herself full. But when she leaves Moab, all she has is her two Moabite daughters-in-law. And the one she has successfully chased off, really. The other's faith prevailed despite her. She comes back without her husband and two sons, and she, ex she exclaims she's empty. This isn't true faith. She has Yahweh. Yahweh has brought her back graciously to her people in the promised land. She has everything in Yahweh. And notice how she does this right in front of Ruth. Does Ruth really mean anything to her? She says she's come back empty. Is this Ruth just some Moabite trash to Naomi? I think that's the wrong assessment if that's the case, obviously. Because we'll see what the people think of her later on. And we'll see what a man named Boaz thinks of her later as well. The Lord has brought me back empty. And then she closes her words by saying, Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? She says it again. She really believes the Lord is her enemy and against her. One thing I want us to remember is that the Lord is never our enemy in our suffering, if we're His, even if we've been disobedient for a time, um, or in our suffering, it may feel like that, but the Lord is never our enemy. Even in our suffering, because of our disobedience, He's not our enemy. He may discipline us as a father disciplines a child. It's out of love, right? trying to draw us to him. A lesson we can learn from Naomi also, well, what's a lesson that we can learn from her right now? It's pretty simple. Not to be what? Not to be bitter. A lesson we can learn from Naomi is to beware of the temptation to become bitter in our suffering. That's a real temptation, isn't it? We all experience suffering for a lot of different reasons. Many times we don't know the reason for our suffering. But no matter what the reason is for, it can be a major temptation to become bitter. Maybe our hurts start out simply just by not getting something we want. Or something we think we deserve. Watch out for bitterness right here. Cut it off. Cut it off at the roots. Perhaps we can suffer greatly. Major tragedy has struck us. How many in the faith have thrown up their hands and said, I'm out when major tragedy or some hardship has struck their life? God took something away and they became bitter. God didn't bring them what they wanted. They became bitter and walked away. And so we need to beware of the bitter monster, right? We need to beware of that ugly monster rising up in our hearts. Now, I don't think it's fair to just beat up totally on Naomi right here. I see a woman who we can all relate to. If you're anything like me, 
there can be times when maybe you're, you're disobedient. There can be times that you haven't lived up to God's standard. Maybe if you're like me, you could be in the study. Uh, maybe if you're like me, you can be ungrateful at times. Like Naomi. If you're anything like me, maybe uh, you've had a season of bitterness. Or something in your life like that. I think it would be incorrect to write Naomi totally off here. And we see in some of her language that, that denotes that she's still clinging on to God. Despite her condition and despite her recklessness and her suffering. In chapter 1 verse 9, Naomi recognizes it is the Lord who gives good gifts to his people. And then she's recognizing that all of her life is in the Lord's hands. She recognizes that God is sovereign over her condition. She is not worthy of emulation here. But she is still clinging to faith. And so another thing we can learn from Naomi and how God works with his people is that even in our suffering and our trials and our disobedience is that God can and will build his kingdom. Now I want to say it's not a license to sin. That would be incorrect to think so, that we're free to sin even though... <clears throat> God may use some situation. That's, that's incorrect. But we can be faithful that if God is going to use even someone like imperfect Naomi, he can use us to build his kingdom. How, how did God build his kingdom through Naomi? What? Yeah, uh, yes, the, the line of Jesus uh, will come through her. Exactly. That, that's, uh, the most, that's the biggest way, right? the most significant way. Um, that he's building his kingdom through her. How do, how do we see, who comes to faith through her in the text? Ruth, Ruth right? Um, Naomi uh, really does a bad job, right? But God uses her, right? Maybe, um, maybe Naomi uh, was telling her about Yahweh back in Moab and, and it convinced her. I don't know how that all worked out. But the fact is, is that God used her to bring Ruth into the kingdom. I want us to notice that, first of all, God didn't leave her just to die. He brings her back to the treasured land. And on the journey back, her bitterness <laughs> spills out, and she almost pushes both of the girls away, but Ruth sticks with Naomi. Like we said, perhaps it is the stories of Yahweh that Naomi had told Ruth throughout the years that drew Ruth into following him. But in chapter 1, verses 16 through 17, Ruth gives her life over to Yahweh. God has used imperfect Naomi to bring this Moabite woman into the kingdom. With Ruth's declaration, the focus of the narrative overall has switched from Naomi to her. In our text this morning, the author highlights Naomi just one more time. Even in her mess, God has chosen to use her for the purpose of building his kingdom. Isn't that encouragement for us? That God can still use us despite being perfect people. That God will and still uses us Let's look at the significance of what is happening here. Look, let's look at the profundity of what God is doing here in the storyline of redemption. Let's look at what Ruth says in verses 16 through 17. Does someone want to read that? Chapter 1, verses 16 through 17. Read uh, Ruth's confession. Okay. Go ahead, Ms. Laura. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will, shall be, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more. 
also, if anything, but death, any, no, death parts from me from you. Uh, thank you. Look at what she said. Do these words sound familiar to you after hearing that? If they do, it's probably because you've heard them somewhere else, right? There's a song that they sing at weddings. And yeah. It, and it, they sang that song at my daughter's both there at the wedding. It was a uh, pattern off of this? Yeah, then. yeah. Yeah, I know there's some great, there's some songs out there that uh -huh. pattern off this. It's an old song. Yeah. I would like to find out. What, do you know the name of that song? Okay, yeah, let me know later. Yeah. Do we hear similar language in the Bible somewhere else? This. I'm sorry. I'm thinking that Peter said that to Jesus. Kind of similar like that. He, he made a profession that, yeah, that he would always be with them, right? How about in the Old Testament? Say that again. Does this, does this language sound familiar where, where she says things like, for where you go, I will go. Yeah. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. And your God, my God. This is, really, this is covenant language, right? In Leviticus 26, God lays down what the blessings will be for his people if they remain obedient to him. And this is what he says. Listen to this. He says, I will turn to you and make you fruitful and multiply you and will confirm my covenant with you. And then in verse 11, he says, I will make my dwelling among you and my soul shall not abhor you. Verse 12. And I will walk among you and will be your God. And your and you will be, or sorry, and you shall be my people. That's very similar language, isn't it? Ruth says, Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. This is covenant language, and we find this in other uh, language elsewhere in the Old Testament. Not only in just Leviticus. So what is the author doing here then? The author is pointing us to God's covenant with his people. He's pointing us to the greater plan of redemption. And the bringing of Ruth into his kingdom. And to be a part of God's people. God just might be doing something on a grand scale with her. And Ruth... Chapter 1, verse 22, the last verse of this chapter, and the last verse of this last scene, the author summarizes what's happened thus far. And he points forward and gives us a hint to what's to come, to what's ahead. Verse 22 says, So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. Ruth is mentioned to be a Moabite in this verse, and the author has already made it a point to mention that she is a Moabite multiple times. The author just might seem to be pointing of what's to come. Will Gentiles be included? in this plan of salvation. Notice how the author opened the book. Where did the author open the book? Where was the setting? In the days of the judges. In what village? Uh, they were in Bethlehem. Bethlehem at first. They go to Moab. But it opens in Bethlehem. There was no food in the house of bread. As Becky said, a famine. And after a series of tragic events in God's kindness, he has brought these ladies back. To where? To Bethlehem, right? 
And here in Bethlehem, the, the remainder of the story will take place. Soon in Israel's storyline, we know there will be a king. This king will be a man after God's own heart. And uh, where will he be from? Bethlehem. Yes, Bethlehem. And then there will be another promised king who would reign forever and save his people from their sin. And where will he be born? Bethlehem. Yes, the lion of the tribe of Judah will be born in Bethlehem. And how will this all unfold? Yes, we know through the line of Ruth here, through a marital relationship involving her. And what are we at the beginning of when we find ourselves back in Bethlehem? What's going on? There's a harvest, right? A barley harvest. It's interesting that the house of bread is full again when they come back. When God has brought them back. Well, who is the true bread of life? Jesus Christ. May this be pointing forward to what's to come. And how is Ruth going to meet the man she will marry? That the line of the Messiah may be perpetuated through her. In other words, how is she? In other words, how is she going to get her Boaz? What's that? A kinsman redeemer. That's right. That's what he will be. But where will she be noticed? In the fields. In the fields the, during a harvest, right? Oh, yeah. I don't want to give away too much. <laughs> but um, it's pointing to what's, the author is hinting and pointing to what's, what's coming, guys. And so uh, if the story seems to be kind of sad so far, it's going to get a lot happier. And... Um, I want us just to remember that this first chapter, just there's so much to learn from. And today, we just see that even in our suffering, God will never abandon us. Right? Their suffering is never the end of the matter. Things can get better even on this side of eternity. But if they don't, it's still not the end of the matter, is it? If we're in Christ, we have Christ. We have everything in Him. Christ is everything. And we'll have eternal riches. And we'll have anything we could ever... And we'll, it'll be greater than anything we could ever imagine to, to be with Him and to stare at His glory for an eternity. And another thing to remember is that even in our suffering, even in our messes, God can still use us and he will use us, right? Anybody want to comment or say anything before we close or mention anything? Well, next week, I think we'll start to see this harvest. So I look forward to that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we are just so thankful, Lord, that you're faithful to keep your promises. You're faithful to us. Even as, uh, as your children, you're, you're still faithful to us, even in our suffering, even in our trials. Lord, that you will not abandon us, that it won't be the final end of the matter, never. Father, we trust that you are doing something through us in it. Lord, we pray, Father, and we trust you, even when we can't understand sometimes that you're doing something mighty. You're doing something eternity-shaping. Treasures are being stored up in heaven. Father, we pray that you would be with us in the service this morning. Lord, be with uh, the preaching. And the worship, Lord, we pray that we've come together in greater love, to unify us even greater. Father, we pray that our hearts and minds will be shaped and molded according to your word this morning. 
In your son's name we pray. Amen.